So now on 4 Extra, two of comedy's most slimline specimens, Jeremy Hardy and Mark Steele, chew the fat on a bench in a South London park. The programme comes from 2008 and there's some very strong language. The difference with us is we're not bitter. (laughs) (laughs) No, God forbid. I really hate bitter people. (laughs) (laughs) You're all right, though. You get loads of telly. I don't. I've bloody... not been on the telly for fucking years. And now years. another interesting Mark Steele talk about history. They were always bloody... Yeah, well, that's, your, that's a sign of how old you are. That that's is recently. That you think, is that you think that's <laughs> recently. Go, oh, it's like one of these... Oh, I don't like some of this new music with the big floppy air and the singing about <laughs> gold and it's true or whatever it is. What do they call them? The, the you know, the new robotics. <laughs> <laughs> That was ages ago. That's when was years ago. When? When did you stop doing that? That's years ago. I that, missed it anyway. Three was, years ago, the I last was, series that, that was I on. I was busy. I saw the Beethoven one. That yeah. was good. Yeah, thank you. Have you got any of them on video? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't been on the tea. Don't get asked. I, I had a phase. You, what well, you had? You, you get these old phases. You've been on so for some reason. You have a phase where you're asked to go on just absurd things and yeah. I had a little phase of that about I don't know maybe about end of 2006 for some reason and I was asked for my availability on um, I'm a celebrity get me out of here I don't really? think really oh, I've never been asked to and do that I, I, and you know the terrible <laughs> thing I would have to confess not that for a single fraction of a billionth of a second did I ever consider going on it. That's nothing to do with principles. I'm just fucked if I'm jumping out of helicopters. <laughs> but I just, I thought I was quite proud of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Which that's is terrible, good. Isn't it should it? be asked. I've never been, I don't get asked to be on anything like that. You know, it'd be like if I was asked to be king, I think <clears> no, with principles are such that as a lifelong it would be nice to be there would be an element of compromise with being king I think you've got to be related to someone it's very nepotistic (laughs) in the royal family it's all it's not what you know it's all who you're related to but uh I know I don't get asked to do anything. I don't get asked to do. You used to get asked to do. No, there is. I can honestly say I've not been asked to do anything but move on in the last year. (laughs) Nothing. Uh, Radio. On the radio all the time. Radio. Yeah, but that just means that I'm about to die. That's just old age. I don't get asked to do any TV at all. Sort of having a clue and news. Oh no, that's fantastic! Things, yeah, no, no, that's Think of the most television programs. Well, that's you true. could be the overwhelming majority of television programs don't get anywhere near as much as they w- would get in terms of you know, people that's true. listening, watching, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Yes. No, radio is good. It's just a demographic that's a bit vulnerable because they keep dying. Mm. I was on a. Uh, I was asked to go on a program. Uh, I looked at the messages, and it said. Uh, oh, I can't remember which I think BBC I think would like Mark to consider being a um, a guest on our new series Underdogs and in my naivety I thought it'll oh, be about sounds, refugees yeah this sounds quite good it'll be about you know about a bloke <laughs> with no arms who climbed up Mount Everest or something or you know I don't know someone without a head who became a civil rights campaigner or something I don't know and then um <laughs> when I read down, the idea of the programme was that each week a celebrity would be teamed up with a dog from a dog's home. <laughs> OK. And, uh, and with someone who was a dog trainer, a professional dog trainer. Right. And the, the little team of you, of the three of you, you, the dog trainer and the, the wild dog, uh, you would have to, you would be taught how to train the dog and at the end of each week's programme that you know however many there were eight to start with dog celebrity pairings would have to do a little show in the studio did you, you have know. to do stand up to an audience of dogs <laughs> 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 that's what they do though on these things I was asked to go to France and learn to speak French and do a gig for French people and I thought well if I could, it would be really useful to speak French but why go through? And, it, and I had to be with somebody like Ron Atkinson, and and uh, Janet Street Porter, and Joe Pasquale, or something. <laughs> it was like York Hyder and the Crankies, or something. And um, I thought, no, I'm just not. I can't. I'll just I'll just get a CD and learn how to speak French on my own. Well, that's you asked to do it. Yeah, well, that's yeah, but it's just you've got to have some dignity, haven't you? I mean. 
Did you ever do one of those I Love programs? Oh, I got trapped. I did the, I did the one about... I did a terrible one, which was um, about animation. And I remember there used to be an animation... What was it called? It was an car, American cartoon, uh, something about the family or something. And there was a character who looked like Nixon and he was a vigilante. Right. Anyway, so I mentioned this in this thing, and this turned out to be number 99 on this programme. I talked about The Simpsons and South Park and all, and, you know, and all those other things as well. But I thought, well, will, this programme came on the telly, and I thought, I'll, I'll give it five minutes, you know. And then I was on TV straight away. I thought, oh, bloody hell, that's good. I'm on at the beginning. But I didn't think, yeah, but that's because it's number 99, which is like the second least good one. And I watched the next three hours of this thing, and I wasn't on again. So all there was was me saying what I've just said That's to you. That's probably how they get the viewing figures up, is they probably interview Ask millions of people in the country, and everything. Yeah. So I'll be on it. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, a joke, well, Lamar, Mark Lamar has a joke with me that um, the, the only the only free people, he says, who won't, who, who won't appear or any old shit on the telly, he said, he, well, he said to me one night, it's just, he said, it's me, you, and uh, me, you, and Jeremy Paxman, he said. So, uh, a few days later, I'm lying on the set here at home on a Saturday night, the house is empty, and I was flicking through the channels, and there was a programme about carry-on films, and now a look at the great old British traditional film, the, uh, the, the carry-on series, and all this sort of thing, no, all this, and I thought, I'll watch this for a bit, and they're showing clips, and Barbara Windsor's bra coming off, and all that sort of thing, and infamy, infamy, they've all got it, infamy, and all that sort of thing, and I'm mildly enjoying this. Yeah, then up pops someone of no consequence to sort of say, oh, the thing with the carry-on films is they were so saucy, <laughs> and all these sort of stupid little asides that people say. And then I was on there, and I thought, well, it was a real shock. No. I was sort of half a set, I thought... What? And I don't remember doing this at all. I couldn't for the life of me think, remember doing it. I thought, what? What am I doing on that? How is that possible? How? I just, and I, was, and I was sat there thinking this was possibly a dream. The phone rang, and I sort of, in a trance, I picked it up, and it was Mark Lamar, and he went, just me and Paxman now. They <laughs> put the phone down. I had that. I, t- I was channel hopping late at night, and it, 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 I came on the television, and it had it was like... I don't remember doing it. It was a moment of existential panic. I thought, which one's really me? And and uh, and there I'm there, and it's me on the telly. And I was like, no, this isn't happening. This isn't real. And and then I sort of gradually unravelled what it was, and it was one about stand-up comedy, the 50 best stand-up comedians. All oh, right. But the problem with it was that although I was being interviewed, I wasn't one of the 50 oh, stand-up cruel, comedians. It? So it meant I was a bit. <laughs> I had a thing like that. I was having an evening on my own watching hardcore porn, <laughs> and there I was. <laughs> there I was with this huge Turkish wrestler. I don't remember doing it. There's a point where you think, um, you know, career, when you think, oh, imagine anybody coming along just to see. You know, the first time yeah, I did yeah. a, uh, my own show in Edinburgh. I remember thinking, my <coughs> ambition here in terms of an audience, if I can go the whole three weeks without having to cancel a night because no one's turned mm. up. And I thought, by no one, I'll, I'll, I'll do the show if there's five. But if there's... And I think the lowest I had was seven or something. And I thought this was glorious. You know, the you, idea that these people had come <coughs> to see my old copy. I mean, I look back on it, it was probably rubbish, most of it. But, uh, you know, there we are, I got... I think it was 41 night or something. I was delirious. You did something which I which I admired and followed, which is you very quickly got off the circuit and started doing it. You know, instead of doing two, an audience of 200 people at Junglers, you started, you'd, you'd do four people at the Fimbra to do two hours because you'd rather do two hours to four people than, yeah. than Junglers, you know. And, and I sort of thought, yeah, I'm going to do that because you, you got off the circuit really quickly and very quickly started getting an audience around the country. In the no, last I didn't. didn't. I you? didn't, you? No, it took me ages and ages. And then there's a time when I started trying to do my own thing. And then, but, you know, because financially, you know, four, I was hopeless. People, yeah. four people at the Fimbra, you know, for two hours. But uh, there's not a great deal of money in that. So you, you have to, no, it took me ages and ages. <clears> and then, so you have to keep going back and doing the gigs. But... Then I, it is, but then you're in the worst of both worlds, if you like. And then, um, 
I remember going there eventually. I went to uh, uh, you'd go and do these shows uh, and be down to do half an hour or something at the, at the end, and then there'd be all these other acts on, and it'd just completely sort of you know it'd be out of your control completely. This whole thing would be set up that is nothing to do with you. And, yeah. And uh, not that I'm snobbish about that. You know, there's place for all those acts and they're fine and all that sort of thing but it's very difficult to follow that with what you want to do especially when it, they go down much better than we do especially yeah yeah and then and then i i'd think no i can't do this and then you you pull it round and it'd be all right and i'd think oh this isn't so bad and then one night in portsmouth i was on and there were these compares who were a double act and they said oh we're just going to do a quick bit of mucking about mark just get them you nicely warmed up and then uh, then we'll we'll drag you on they'll, they'll you're going to storm it mark they're going to love you so they go on, right, and then they immediately strip down to this these thongs, and then, for no great reason I could work out, as the audience obviously all knew them, one of them went over to one side of the stage and got a box of eggs and just smashed all the eggs in the other bloke's face and then smashed one in his, in his nuts, <laughs> and then the other bloke went and got some flour and they threw that all over each other and then jelly and, and bits of custard and stuff. <laughs> And, that, and they just did that for five minutes. And then at the end of it went, oh, <laughs> oh my word, Mark Steele. And then, uh, and I walked on and there was this big pile of just shit and cake mix and, uh, and just crap and marzipan everywhere. <laughs> And I thought, oh no. And you've been planning to do that yourself, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. They'd told, stolen my <laughs> joke. My... Yeah. Oh. So, and I thought, no, nah, that is, that that's pretty much it with, with that, really. And I don't mind, you know, if people want to laugh at someone, you know, with the egg in the nuts thing. Oh, I don't like when compares do that thing about trying to make the audience really enthusiastic. Okay, let's start with a small clap. Oh, so, uh, they, what's that? Yeah. they all do that, and they start, and and and, then, and, and let's get it, let's get it really, 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 ladies and gentlemen. You think that doesn't suit me? I, I, no, no, I'm no. used to coming on to people who have just been listening to the world service. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're all like, oh, no, you've... individual comp, a true compare as an individual exactly. style, depending on the comic. You've and for the Jeremy Hardy, yeah. uh, they're supposed to go, and that's all from Nigeria <laughs> on the latest in the decline in the oil reserves. <laughs> Coming up at 1800 GMT. <laughs> Changes really in the structure right. of titanium in the 14th century. <laughs> but first, Jeremy Hardy. I don't want my audience <laughs> turned into Americans before I come on. Oh, I was in America a little while ago. Have you been to America, Mark? Yeah, I oh know. <laughs> yeah, I think it was America. <laughs> or was it Newbury? Yeah, uh, I tell you what, I tell you what, he's been to, la- he's been to America, lady. I tell you what. <laughs> what happened there, Mark? Well, I, I, this, uh, they, they, even a left-wing group, uh, if you can imagine you know, such a group exists in America, uh, but even there, they do all of that woo 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 and stand and cheer. Oh, it's all no. that, yeah. And um, but I don't know. You sort of I, you could warm to it in a way because there's a sort of I don't know enthusiasm. There's an enthusiasm, and they really yes. cheer and you know get. There is like there is a sort of Wednesday evening greeting that you get in places <laughs> like Hertfordshire where you think, why the fuck did you even buy a ticket? <laughs> you sit the audience sitting there. You've paid 15 quid. (laughs) The home count, the triangle of death, Maidenhead, Reading, and what's the other one? There's these three... High Wickham. High Wickham. Fucking High Wickham. (laughs) Bastards. Yep, we'll finish them up. They've, they've, we'll, we'll get them to do all three in a week. They've downsized <laughs> me to the studio venue now, where I'm much happier. I used to play the big, the big room, the Swan. Oh, the yeah. big room. 1,400 people sit in total silence, <laughs> not enjoy a work, and then come again in two years' time and pay another 15 quid. So they've downsized me to the little room now, where I get the fans. God, Maidenhead, that's worse, probably. But there's the other thing that happens when you get an earnest crowd, and I get people not laughing at things because they think that everything you say is a serious point. Especially when I wrote for the Guardian, that was that was quite hard because people thought they were coming for a talk. And you must get some people thinking that they're going to get 
some sort of quite serious left wing critique on things. No, I don't, don't think I get that. No. That's because you're quite oafish, isn't it? I think so. I don't know. No, I don't get. I, I don't get uh, much of a serious crowd. Oh, I, I get very the odd people. one, perhaps. I get, might get the odd <coughs> one. I, um, I mean, because I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I get I get people wander up to me who say, you know, oh, I do like your columns in the Independent, and I have no idea that I'm a hmm. stand-up comic, which is a, a, a strange thing, really. But um, the, with the columns, definitely, there are people who read them and somehow all the sort of ridiculous stupid things I've put in there whether or not they're funny is for other people to judge but I mean they're clearly not meant to be taken literally seriously and I, I wrote one a little while ago about um, about religion and about you know whatever the latest reason there was for a load of people to say that sort of Islam was inherently crazy hmm. uh, oh, for whatever it is you know and oh if you get have you heard what these councils are doing now you know all this sort of thing everyone's got to wear a burqa otherwise it upsets you know the the muslims you know all that sort of thing and um always made up stories and i had in there i said i think one thing that islam should do it should get its own it should retaliate by making up loads of stories about about christians saying oh do you hear about the school where the kids have been banned from playing noughts and crosses because it upsets the christians <laughs> play and hexagons now and i don't i can't remember what the other ones were but loads of things like that yeah. oh and uh, yeah doctors doctors are no longer allowed to say that uh, a patient uh, who's in intensive care is stable because uh, because a stable is where Christians believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was born. So from now on, they have to either say that the patient is improving, uh, or if they can't find an alternative word, just let the patient die. <laughs> and I, so I put a couple, of, and I, it was full of stuff like that. This column, and because online you can people can write their own little comments on it, and I sort of flicked onto it a couple of days later. And there was about 250 bloody comments on there from people. And they were debating the finer points of the Quran. And there was all sorts of like Richard Dawkins people and Christians and rabbis and priests. And they're arguing about the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I was thinking, there was just some silly fucking jokes. What and have uh, you started, Mark? What have you started? I know. But I, I, I now... I, I find religious people more, in some ways, I, f I tend to want to defend them. Because it's like there's this huge kudos in, like, offending them. Like, you write some play. And I know, we'll write a play in which someone buggers a pig in a mosque, and that's going to be really <laughs> liberating. You think, you know that there will be a picket of the play. You know that. And the animal liberationists as exactly. well. Exactly. It's, like, oh, it's, like these fucking, it's always Scandinavia and Holland, these Places, these flat countries where people are boring. They say, I'm going to preach the Quran on the pig's cock because we are totally oppressed. There are two Muslims living in our country and it's like terrible because we can't do anything and it's freedom, you see. It's freedom, the important that we express ourselves. You have a cartoon. It's hilarious in our sense of humour that we have with the cartoons of the Prophet. And all this fucking bad. And I think, no, I'm with the Muslims. Stone them to death, the infidels. <laughs> I, I like I like religious crazies because atheists. Oh, they're so smug atheists. I hate them. Humanists and fucking Dawkins and all these people. I wish the thunderbolt would smite him. Unbeliever. I do. I hate them because at least at least religious people are thinking this world is so fucked that there just has to be something else other than this. I cannot believe it. It's so fucked. You think you found a species that you like. Hedgehogs, oh, they seem nice. And it turns out they eat baby chicks. And you go, oh, God, can't even like hedgehogs now. What kind of world is this? Do you get them come up to your to your gigs, these people? Mad people. No, the conspiracy people. A uh, little bit, a little bit. You just have to sort of not give them your email address. That's very... Oh, no, don't See, do the trouble is, the trouble is now, in the old days, you would never give somebody your telephone number... Uh, or your personal address, but now people expect you to hand over your email address. It's uh, and people people just come up and say, "Can I email you?" And it could be anything. It could be an offer of work. It could be an offer of love. It could be to tell you mad things. Yeah, there's a sort of distance though. I don't. I don't find most people that send stuff. It's it's really sweet, really. You know, it's just. Yeah, but people like you. That's different. 
<laughs> oh, you must get that. You must get all people. I get fan mail sent to the BBC and I get old people complaining about swearing. And stuff. I and I get, they like you, the old people. They do, but then they, but then they don't like it because I swear and then they say we, we won't be coming again but we will continue to enjoy you on the radio. Do they? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. They say we were very disappointed because we do enjoy your performances. On, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the programme. But we shan't be coming again because of the string of F words that we heard. Really? Yeah. And then they don't come anymore. Or either that or they just die over the course of that winter. Which is also quite likely. They're not that old, are they? You're... Yeah, God, yeah. You get really old people come. Yeah, yeah. my demographic is, th- is 35 to 100. Not much below that. Right. You've got, you, you see, you're young, you're down with the kids. Well, not really. Oh, a f- I get a few. I you're, get a f- you're quite Brit pop, aren't you? No, 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 <laughs> no, not really. I don't know, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. You've got a Brit pop haircut. Yeah. You had That's the same. Not deliberate though. You had the same haircut for years, and then for a little while in 1995, it suddenly was like the yeah. haircut of the year. Uh, yeah. And I thought I'll stick with it. It'll come <laughs> again, and it'll be a grey one. Oh lord. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I've made you sad now, haven't I? Well, no, no, yeah, no. I was, I don't, well, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Hardy on a bench in a park. What are you going to expect? Fucking unfettered joy. Little ray of sleet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I was thinking about. I, I was trying to think of, a, of some sort of character of them, perennially, joyfully, falsely happy characters. That you get on like Capital Radio, yeah. That are just laugh, laugh, ha ha. Everything's all not quite like smashy and noisy, but that sort of everything's just fun, fun. Oh well, there's a traffic jam out there, but it really doesn't matter because uh, however you, you might be stuck, but you're stuck with some great sounds and, and all those people and everything's just fun. And I think it's very annoying, you know, and very irritating when some people are sort of forcing fun on you, you know, like these. <laughs> yeah. You know, scouse as you meet, you go, hey, hey, you're all right, hey, you don't mind me, I'm just fucking funny, I'm just talking about it, I'm yeah. just nice to bring a bit of fucking sunshine to people's lives, and you know, <laughs> and then you think, what the, no, I was really at me until I met you, you arsehole, but the, um, but uh, what was the point I was making? Yeah, DJs. But, uh, the DJs, yeah. The, On the, the radio. I was thinking, you're, the chances of you being offered one of those jobs. They're four, usually... Four to six drive time. Capital, <laughs> capital. They're usually Afternoon someone... Drive time with Jeremy Hardy. There's someone Wherever you are, to... however much you're stuck in the traffic, <laughs> however many roadworks there are, however much petrol is leaking out of you and you've, deci- and you've realised the RAC card has run out and your children have just run off in a temper, bear in mind... Life it, will, it get, will worse. get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Smiths. <laughs> But they're always somebody who used to present Blue Peter and murdered somebody. So now they have to do drive time on Radio Skegness. But they, they're they brilliant because we have to talk to them to plug tours and they're always so nice. They're like, well, now I don't know what's going to happen on Radio Skegness because it's, it's all going a bit crazy because we've got a comedian in the, and they pretend that you're in the studio and you're not. You're down the line somewhere and it's two years before the gig but they pretend you've just come off stage or something. They say, it's all going to be all a bit anarchic now. We've got TV funny man, Mark, talks about Mark. But a number of funny things have happened to you, haven't they, today? And then you go, no, not really. <laughs> exactly, smashing Fantastic, great, great sort. And you think you've got to be a special kind of person to keep that enthusiasm. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that, that's there's right. a talent there. But you know when they say, uh, they always say, how did you first get started in comedy? And I got a thing of, uh, I decided to just start making things up. Mm. And uh, the first time I did this uh, was actually on midweek on Radio 4 where the researcher rang up and said, "What? Well, this was a long time ago, probably 15 years ago, maybe more. No, about that. And she said, um, so one of the things Libby would be interested in asking you, Mark, how did you first get started in comedy? I said, oh, it's, it's not that interesting, because for very, very few people, is it that interesting a story? You just realise that you fancy having it, uh, giving it a go, and go. there's a local theatre that's got a comedy night, and you do five minutes, and blah, that's it. So I said, it's really not that interesting. Uh, well, come on, you know. And I said, it's just not interesting. She said, well, what is it? And I said, oh, I don't know. I said, right. Oh, my dad was a 
vodka salesman. And every year we used to go to Poland at Christmas where he would have to make a speech at a vodka factory in Polish. And I had to get up and make a bit of a speech as well because I was seen about four or five years in a row at this vodka factory and all the Poles said, who's that boy, you know, he comes every year and he never says anything. So my dad said, you've got to say something. And of course, you know, as everybody knows in Poland, you know, the easiest thing to learn to start with in Polish is the jokes. And so I told some jokes and they went down very, very well. And, um, and so uh, from that, I was at the age of 15 booked to do a regular slot in the canteen during the lunch break at a nearby vodka distillery. And I said this to this woman and I was, you know, just asking about really as a sort of way of saying it's really not very interesting what the way I was brought up. And then two or three days later, I was on midweek with Libby Purvis and they've, you know, she's done her bit with a bloke who's sailed around the Isle of Wight in a thimble or whatever it was, <laughs> the things that, that happen, you know, someone who, uh, you know, I don't know, had, I don't know, his head fell off and then still managed to live another eight years. <laughs> and then, uh, now my next guest is uh, is Mark Steele. Welcome, Mark, to the programme. A couple of silly little bits of, you know. And Mark, uh, now you had a very, very uh, interesting beginning into the world of comedy, didn't you, I said, I don't know, Libby, you've caught me there a little bit, live on air. Uh, I didn't really. Well, Mark's being rather modest, so let me enlighten the listener. <laughs> Mark's father was a salesman at a vodka factory. <laughs> and oh, she did the whole no. thing, yeah. Oh, and so no. I thought, well, I'm going to start um, <laughs> making up more of these. Did you say, sorry, that that's not true? No, I you mean it was so ridiculous. You just pretended that it was all true. Well, I just went, oh, good sort of thing. I don't know. I'd have to listen to it back. I can't entirely they won't remember. Still have a tape of it. They'll have wiped it. They'll have recorded over, over it many times. Yeah. It's a shame though. Yeah, but I, um, and I've done this a number of times since, and uh, so and then sometimes you know. So then I was on Johnny Walker's program, and he said. Uh, uh, you had a very interesting start to uh, comedy, didn't you? And I thought, oh, no, here we go. I said, oh, what's it got? Oh, the, obviously, the thing he's been given. And he said, uh, well, being a television repair man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, there's been some interview I'd done for the Open University that they then put on the website for the programme I did, which was sponsored by the Open University, uh, in which the bloke said, how did you first get started in comedy? And I said, well, the thing was, uh, I was a television repair man. And if we were told in our handbook that if you were at to take people's television away to be repaired, then people could get very, very upset and sometimes quite violent. But uh, they'd done studies, and if you left people with just a little bit of entertainment, then they felt that that might sort of last them the two or three days before they expected to get the telly back. So we all had to sort of learn a joke and, and then use that to tell people when we were taking their television away. And, uh, and <laughs> my ones went very well, and I won the, uh, the Trade Television Repairman's Joke of the Month Award on three consecutive occasions, and uh, the career just all took off from there. Most of the people that've written about it, they've sort of, especially the sort of lazier ones, will say, uh, "Well, it was a time when you could just have a go at Thatcher, and you know, everyone was anti-Tory, and it was all left-wing and so on." But it wasn't that. It was a, it was anarchic, as yeah. I remember it. It wasn't left-wing. It wasn't the content wasn't was from really. very few people. Yeah. Even from us, it wasn't particularly left-wing. I don't remember doing much about Thatcher and stuff at that time. No, it was. Just anarchic, so you'd have a comic on who'd be sort of a bit loud and shambolic and so on, and then you'd have someone like Podomovsky on with yeah, a load yeah. of peculiar toys, and it wasn't, it, uh, or somebody melting an iceberg. Who was that bloke who used to melt an iceberg? Can't remember. I remember a bloke, Bernie, there used to be a high wire act. He used to get his high wire act, and these people were <laughs> unicycles, juggling raw spaghetti. There was a performance dancer called all dancers performance but you know what I mean Yol Yolanda Snaith who went on to become really successful in the world of contemporary dance and she, I remember her doing an open spot at the Bearcat Club in Twickenham just being uh, people laughing because of sort of her breasts were falling out of her outfit but which, you, which in the contemporary dance thing you would never comment on you know you just sort of think oh that's contemporary dance oh that's dance. obviously you know that, that's yeah. alright that's contemporary but, yeah, and, that's I, symbolic of the collapse of the Soviet Union yeah. or something but it was, um, no, it was, it was chaos. And, and at the time, I'd find it irritating. I think, oh, you go on stage and there'd just be crap all over because somebody had been on there cutting up, you know, 
daffodils with a chainsaw or something, and you think, oh god, I just want to do my jokes. But now it's all. Oh, now it's this all. This is the chainsaw daffodil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it has Fantastic. all got very slick now, hasn't it? It's all very organised. No, you wouldn't get that. That's no. yeah, yeah, you, uh, yeah. But by the same token, we could go on and just be probably fairly shit. And get away with year it. Year in, get for- year out. No, not and year what in, year has out. happened to that <laughs> great tradition? No, but for a bit, for a few months, and you get 40 quid, and you think, bloody hell, that's good, that's double your benefit. And, um, well, and I'm it sure was quite there is forgiving. Still there. No, there still will be that, I think. Will there? Yeah, you Do know. They still have a- paper money. <laughs> I put everything on the card these days. No, but they, I, I think I bet now... I the chainsaw daffodil, man. It is, takes people it, months it to get... It costs him more than that in petrol. But you could get an open spot the following day. You can't now, apparently. You have no, to wait you months. book up for months. No, you book up for months for these these things. And um, I don't know. There's one just... You know, they're, they're just round the corner. They're from everywhere. Here. They're all over the place. They're, but that's all right. I think that's all right. They're, they're much... Um, they're much more professional, you know, because in the mid '80s, you would do, you do your twenty minutes. If someone came along who hadn't seen you for six months, and they saw you, and over half of your twenty minutes was different, then that's the way you write the new material is amazing, and that'd be like a minute and a half a month in effect yeah. that you'd, you'd written. But now I think that it is expected that a lot of the acts, a lot of the acts that go and do well, I mean, they'll write a new hour every year for Edinburgh and all that sort of thing, which we, yeah, I don't know, that's, I think that's, that's made us get better as well, really, to keep up with them, because Probably, we never yeah. used to, we never used to write that quickly to... I think they have a facility with TV as well. I still look gormless on TV. I mean, I just feel like I get distracted and I'm sitting there thinking... What? Oh fuck! I'm doing a program, and then but other people are all like they know what they're doing and they're all on top of it. And, <laughs> is um, that the art? Is that the professional art of telly not to get distracted? Not to get distracted. <laughs> and I now think. the news with Hugh Edwards. <laughs> oh, I've put that bag somewhere. <laughs> I went to Summerfields and I. Hang on, I've got a bit about the massacre <laughs> in Kenya coming up. I think it, it is like that though. People are people are really focused on what they do now. And there's a whole generation of us that are just a bit, are still sort of thinking of it. Part in the back of my mind, I'm still doing a miners' benefit somewhere within a place where they've forgotten to get a PA. <laughs> Mark Steele and Jeremy Hardy having a chat on a park bench in 2008. The producer was Mike O'Brien, and it was a laughing stock production for the BBC.